Ratio Christi is an apologetics group. We want to equip students and faculty to give historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Christ. Hi, Michael. Um, and we just want to establish the intellectual voice of Christ at the university. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about theological triage. And what do I mean by triage? Well, we, we all kind of understand what a medic in a battlefield or an ER at the a doctor at ER would do to treat severely injured people first and then less severely injured people. people. Um, they, do, those kinds of doctors are equipped with an understanding of the hierarchy of importance regarding injuries. So if you get a bee sting, you probably ought to go to urgent care. If you step on a beehive, and my husband is a beekeeper, so I, know, I think this is true. If you step on a beehive, you're probably going to go to the emergency room. So that's just, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Um, so that's what we're talking about, triage. We're, we're trying to understand the importance of different doctrines and if there's a hierarchy. So our aim tonight really isn't to, for all of us here, to agree where every doctrine, sh doctrine should be categorized. But rather, what we want to do is be able to make the case for the need to rank doctrines in order of importance, and then just get used to developing the skills to do theological triage. We're going to do an example. We're going to go through kind of uh, a general um, format and criteria and everything, and then we're going to go through an example. So this is the resource I use, Finding the Right Hills to Die On by Gavin Ortland. It's a great introduction to this topic. I, I wouldn't think it's the probably the end all. He's Protestant, so it's definitely coming. He's coming from a Protestant perspective. Also, I'm not a theologian, so uh, that's my first disclaimer. And if you're not a Christian, I just want to say, or if you're, yeah, if you're not a Christian, if you're an unbeliever, a skeptic, or even of another religious faith, um, tr you still need to do triage probably on your beliefs, on, on ranking importance, right? What's a deal breaker for you in your hierarchy of, of beliefs? So this whole presentation isn't for naught if you're not a Christian because you would still gain some skills and, and stuff to know how to do that. So which hill should I die on? That's the question, right? This is, that, that was the title of his book, The Right Hills to Die On. There's really two extremes that we want to stay away from. So the first extreme is the dogmatist. And th for this guy, for this person, this girl, every hill is a hill to die on. Every doctrine is a hill to die on. There's no distinction between doctrines. And if you're my interlocutor and you disagree and have a different view, then I would see you not as having a, debatable, a different view on a debatable issue, but that you're a heretic because every doctrine is this first rank doctrine. So what would be some, pro does anyone know, have, were you raised like that to think that, that there's no important or less important views or uh, do, do, you, uh, do you understand this first dogmatist view? And what are some problems? What might be a problem with that view? What problems could you run into? Trey? You kind of get locked into the idea of um, it's so important for me to, um, like you get, maybe you get locked into baptism over sharing the gospel, or you're locked into um, you're focusing on a, a bunch of minute details, or maybe you're arguing with a uh, with these theologians, and you you realize that you're not actually practicing the religion that you say you're practicing. Yeah, you could be quarreling about a, a lot of things that aren't, you know, ultimately what you want to die. Do you really want to die for every doctrine? That would, you know, you could keep that in your mind, right? Um, but it is a there's a good thing about it though, because this person has convictions, right? has strong convictions and probably is very courageous and bold. But maybe, so you could have a strong conviction, but not have studied a lot of 
of an opposing view or different views, so you're locked into a view that you grew up with or you were told or you were taught, but not really looking more broadly at some, where someone else is coming from. And maybe you might not have as many friends, right? <laughs> I'm thinking this person doesn't, is kind of, has a small circle of friends, right? very much kind of an echo chamber. It might be an echo chamber, yeah. So then there's the other end of the spectrum that we also don't want to be uh, you know, guilty of is the minimalist. For this person, there aren't any hills to die on. And they, they seem to be, this person is a little bit indifferent to theology or even theological differences. So they're not worried about any kind of theolo theological differences. And they might just say, well, we just need to love Jesus and feed the poor, and we just don't need, we don't need all this theology. We don't need to argue about anything, okay? So this person, what are some problems with, so they might get along with lots of folks, right? <laughs> they, they probably have a broad, you know, range of people they're friends with, but what might be a problem with that? Sam? Perhaps they are ditching the vocabulary and distinctions that are helpful in, that are ultimately helpful in certain practical matters. So that might be the criteria for triage if, if a belief is ultimately relevant to practice or, or something like that, then it might be higher up on the list. Yeah. Anything else? Why, why this might be a problem? Yeah. I feel like they might be more susceptible to just kind of believing what they, whatever they hear, and then they might be able to, or they might go and then spread that to someone else, and it can kind of just lead to a chain reaction of like really bad theology. Yeah, they, they might hold some false beliefs, right? Since they're so open to everything and, and nothing uh, matters. What were you going to say? Uh, just kind of what he was saying, like you're more likely to compromise on really important issues. Right, right. And, and not, not die for, you know, not be willing to die for your faith which we don't in America right now, but, you know, who's to say? Okay. So, but you might say, is there really scriptural support for do this ranking? Jackson? Well, I have a Bible verse, so you say yours first. And then I'll say oh, you want to say, you want to say, you want to have a Bible verse for this? Well, Give it to me. Okay, it's Romans 10, 2. It says, for I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Um, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Uh, and so it's like this interesting, like there's a passion for God, but it's for the wrong God. Right. Right. It's not on the list. Huh? It's not on the list. It's okay. It's okay. I think that's a, that also kind of um, is a good verse for the minimalist, right? For the one. Yeah. Yeah. I should have had that one. Thank you, Jackson. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, this is, this is actually um, New Testament scholars have noted that this, these verses are probably the earliest oral creed that we have of the early church. And Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So he's, you know, he's kind of making a distinction there. Uh, whatever else you know, this one, this that I told you is of first importance. And then in Romans 14, 1, 1 through 19, and this isn't the only place, but he's talking about that there were some quarrels and arguments about food and feast days and practices um, that, he, that he said shouldn't be a problem for people. And he said that some issues are matters of opinion. They're not to be, you're not to be dogmatic or legalistic about it. So he says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Don't quarrel over opinions. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Remember in the early, ch in, in uh, the Gentiles, they had meat sacrificed to idols and it, it was just against their conscience to eat that meat if you were a Gentile. But some who knew there wasn't anything, uh, 
it was it was uh, neutral that they could eat the meat because they they didn't they didn't have that practice of of having past uh, sacrificing that meat to idols. So he says, I know I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean in their conscience. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and of, for mutual upbuilding. So here he's saying some things are matters of opinion and shouldn't be held dogmatically. And then some further ones, Ephesians 2.8, I think some things are clear, and, and Paul is, is um, a, he stresses a lot that the gospel is clear. So he says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. And then later he says, look, if you know that's clear, then any man preaching to you a gospel contrary to, what you, to which you receive, let him be accursed. So he's just saying, you have some, you can have judgment here on what's important. And he, he says in a lot of places that the gospel is of first importance. And also, as you're probably aware, the bodily resurrection of Jesus was also, is also extremely important. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. And then we've been made false witnesses because we're witnessing to his resurrection. If, it, if he, uh, um, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worth, worthless and you're still in your sins. So I would say that, you know, we're talking about a, a something that's of first importance, which is the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So from, from Gavin Ortland's book, and you can find this kind of hierarchy in other places. So he's not the only one that talks about this. But um, what we want to do is say, well, what are we talking about? How do we define these hierarchies? And the first one we would say First rank doctrines are essential, and mainly they're essential to the gospel itself. Second rank doctrines, we would say they're very important and urgent for the health and practice of the church, but they can cause Christians to separate at the level of denominations in a practice. Third rank are important to theology, but not enough to separate over. Okay, And fourth rank are unimportant to the gospel altogether. Actually, we shouldn't quarrel about them at all. <laughs> okay, so are you with me? What do you think about those categories? So there's really the first two are the hardest ones to probably put the doctrines in. And, and we, we probably will not have full agreement tonight over, over this. Um, but you can for yourself understand what would be essential for you to the gospel and then what would be urgent for your tradition or your church. Sam? Is that uh, Portland's writing? Yes, these are his. But, they, but, but actually, I found this other, other places. Okay. So I'm it, surprised to see eschatology as high as it is. Um, it's, it's important, but not, not, it, it's not divisive in the church, not divisive in, uh, theologically important. I think you could, are you saying it should be fourth? He has uh, it in the lowest, second to lowest category. He has it in the second, third rank. Yeah. Um, so that would be something you might differ with someone in your congregation about eschatology, which is end times. Um, but you probably wouldn't think that they sh should be kicked out of your church over, unless your church is very um, specific about which view they hold. Or do you go to a church that's very specific about, no? Okay. Which is part of why I'm surprised it's Well, third rank is low. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not high. Don't think, don't think of third, third rank as high. But it is important to theology, right? You might not think so today, but... 
Yeah, okay. I think it has some implications. I think I was just gauging the room, honestly. <laughs> You're trying to see whether, if, whatever. That, what did you say? I think eschatology can have some implications for like, what do you see, kind of, like how the end times are going to play out, and have some implications for how we should kind of live today, right? So it's not. It's not. It's not unimportant, it can right? Affect daily life, but it's not something. And I don't think we're trying to, to figure out a like a Rashi or Christi text saying in like a list that we all agree on right now. I think it's just kind of yeah, understanding yeah. what these what these but, categories might be. But just so you know, but actually most of them put eschatology in third rank, just for Sam's benefit. Yeah, uh, it does usually end up there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good for you, Sam. What? It can. It can. Okay. So Lewis, C.S. Lewis has an analogy about what we're talking about, and not everybody agrees with him, but I thought I'd throw it out there because it's a way to, th it's a way to picture it in your mind. So um, this is in Mere Christianity. So, in the, in, so he's trying to describe what he's going to do in the book, what he's trying to, um, his aim in the book. And his point is to describe the core, the mere essence, the fundamental beliefs associated with the Christian faith. But he wasn't actually advocating a particular tradition, even though he was Anglican. He wasn't advocating his Anglican tradition. And he wasn't trying to keep people from joining a tradition. And this is how he explains it. If Christendom, Christendom, Christendom is the house, there's a hall, which is the fundamental unifying beliefs of Christendom. And the rooms are different traditions in the house. OK? Um, he says, the mere Christ the, the essentials are more like a hall out of which doors open into several rooms. If I can bring anyone into the hall, I shall have done what I attempted. But it is in the rooms, not the hall, that there are fires and chairs and meals. The hall is a place to wait in, not to live in. Okay? So he wanted to get people into the hallway. That was what he was doing with mere Christianity, to introduce them to Christ. Lewis pointed them to the rooms, the specific traditions and denominations, if you will, where they would engage in fellowship, warm themselves by the fire, and enjoy a meal. But he said, don't make a room where he's put a hallway. So don't make mere Christianity isn't a tradition. It is the hall. Um, now, I know, I know that there's objections. Uh, Catholics and Orthodox believers object to this analogy. Uh, mainly, they would say that Catholicism or our Orthodoxy isn't a room. It is the house, right? So we do have people that would object to that analogy. But from Gavin Ortland's Protestant and C.S. Lewis's way of thinking about it, there are essentials that we all can, um, are unified by, no matter the tradition. And so that was his point. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what I want you to latch on to. So why would, why, what are the reasons <clears throat> we should do theological triage? Well, one is to know what the doctrines are that unify the church. And the, the other thing is to understand what partnerships are appropriate for us, for you. Can you, have, can you do ministry with a person that's not in your specific tradition but holds to those unifying fundamentals? Probably so, I would say. That would be us here. Um, to learn how to handle differences in convictions without losing your faith. Sometimes if you've been raised in, that, in the extreme position of dogmatism, then if everything's essential, and then as you grow older and mature, if, one of those, if you find out one of those things 
isn't in the center or that you're wrong about it, it you can be, your faith can become can unravel. And we don't and that's what we don't want to happen. Um, we want to follow Jesus' model of grace and truth in these matters. And also, sometimes we don't know that there are some debatable doctrines in the Bible. And what do you think I mean by debatable? There are some things that aren't obviously clear or they're debatable. Right? Katie? Katie? Hard, yeah. Hard doctrine so it's not quite, you know, there's different, there's, there's honest and sincere Christians who do, do a lot of study and come to different conclusions about eschatology because it's not quite black and white clear. I mean, yeah, Sam. is kind of another one because you have sort of, even though there probably is just one, you know, view expressed in the Bible, we see anywhere from Paul saying, where we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law, versus someone who, like James, who says, where we know that a person is justified by works and not just by faith. So, you know, there's right. some things that are kind of unclear and debatable. So there problem. are, so, so I think what, if, if you were under the impression there weren't a lot of debatable doctrines in the Bible or there's not a select few, well, we want you to know there are and that we want to be able to... Um, how do we handle uh, our friends who hold different views and come to different conclusions? And, you know, we're not, we're not really under persecution right now in America, but all over the world we do have a lot of persecution, uh, Christians do. So we should maybe decide now which hill do we want to die on if, that, if it comes to pass. What, you know... When should we die? When should we, um, say, plant our convictions and say, this is what I believe and you, I'm, I'm, I've, got to, uh, I've got to be persecuted for it? And also just to acknowledge interpretive, interpretive fallibility, kind of what we, we just said, Sam said and Katie said, on debatable issues. Um, I like Proverbs 18, 7 a lot, <laughs> 17. It says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. And a lot of times that's the case. If you, maybe you have a very firm conviction, but no one's ever really challenged you from another view. And so you were real firm about it, but then you're going, oh, well, he has a good point, or I've never thought of that. He challenged me, and I, I, I might need to study some more. So what do I, and the last one is to better advance the gospel. So what do I mean by that? Um, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you're talking to a skeptic or an atheist, and we have a lot of skeptic and atheist friends that come to Russia Christie sometimes. And sometimes uh, the person you're talking to might object to uh, some second or third rank issues. Let's just call it that. Let, we've kind of said what they are, right? They're stuck on these and they need answers. They have objections. I'm not saying those shouldn't be answered because that's what we do at Rush Hill Christie, right? Um, we try to answer people's objections so they can give themselves permission to hear the gospel. But what we want to keep in mind is if we only keep them at, the, at that second rank, third rank objections talk, you know, we need to get them to first rank discussions. So you in your mind can know when we, you've got a hierarchy of doctrines in your mind that you need to get them to talk about first rank issues after you know, you've done your best to answer their objections on second and third rank stuff. Because uh, basically we want to get to the existence and nature of God, the life and death and, and resurrection of Jesus, and our need for a Savior. That's where we need to get our friends. So those are the re were there any other reasons you could think of why you might need triage? Why you might, yeah, Katie? Because you're a student and you're busy and you need to know what you should focus on. <laughs> it's true. It's just like... Tell me, what, tell me what I need to focus on. What's first rank, right? Yeah. 
Well, um, I thought I'd give you some examples. There's, there are good examples in the Bible. I chose Daniel, and I think he's a real good example. Um, remember where he was. He was in Babylon, right? He was not in Israel. He was not in Judah. He had, they had been taken away into captivity, and he's serving at the pagan, you know, Gentile court of Darius, and I'm thinking that he knows what's important and what's not to be able to get to that position um, because he's a follower of God. He's faithful. He, he knows what he believes. But finally, well, do you remember the story? Darius's uh, officers were jealous of Daniel in his high position, and they tricked Darius, the, the king, um, into into an edict that said anyone who, who uh, prays to anyone or consults anyone besides Darius the king is going to be uh, sent to the lions. And so this edict went, went out, and Daniel continued to pray three times a day. And they saw him praying, and they threw him into the lion's den. Okay, so what, what was his first rank issue? What was, he not, what was he not going to do? He wasn't going to de deny what? God, what? Prayer of, of his relationship with God, that God was his God, not Pharaoh, the one true God, right? So that was first rank for him. I mean, he had survived all this time as a consultant to the king, right? And then now um, he decides this is... this. This is first rank. I'm not going to not pray to the one true God and follow this edict. Okay, and then the early Christians, of course, were killed in the Colosseum by the Romans. And what was their hill to die on? What did they, what was, what did they die for? Yeah, the, 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 the gospel, right? The gospel message of, of Jesus. Um, they didn't deny Jesus, and they were fed to the lions. Let's see. Did I have? So 2 million, um, by 200 AD, as many as 2 million had been killed by various Roman emperors from Nero to Diocletian. And then, are y'all too young to remember the Egyptians who were killed by, by Islamic State? Right? You know that, right? Okay, so, and they died for their belief in Jesus. So this is one more that I want to talk about that you might not know about. Some of you do. It's called the diet, which is just an edict. It's not like they went on a diet. Diet of Spire in 1529. And it's just an example from history regarding baptism. And we're going to talk, we're going to do triage on baptism in a minute, so... Stay tuned. But this was a, a, the Holy Roman Empire gave an edict in 1529 ordering Catholics and Lutherans, so they were together on this, to kill Anabaptists. And Anabaptists, uh, the hill that they died on was that they rejected infant baptism and they were, uh, they, they were credo Baptists or, or they baptized adults who had confessed Christ. Right? They rebaptized rebaptized adults, right? Anabaptist means literally means rebaptizers. Rebaptizers. Okay. And so ironically they were drowned, <laughs> which I thought I thought, that's sad, right? They should have I would have rather maybe be beheaded because that it seems like that was a little bit ironic. But Cold, sad. See, it was like they had a like a. They were really like, yeah. Okay, so not only were the Anabaptists what what was their hill they died on? <laughs> on their belief in baptism, right? But also, I wanted the the other coin was that the other uh, opposing side. That, that wasn't the hill they were going to die on, the hill that they killed on. So they were willing to kill 
for their doctrine of baptism, which was pe pedo baptism, right? Baptizing infants. It worked both ways. One side was willing to kill for it. One side was willing to die for their personal view of, of the doctrine of baptism. Okay? So how do you feel about that? Did you all know about this? Obviously, uh, Zach did. Sam did. Sam, Sam Blackburn did. So is it, if you, if you had that conviction, would you think you would have, like, been this, like, firm? No. Who said no? No. I mean, would you really? I mean, would you like go? Yes, I'm. I'm not that guy. You're not that guy. <laughs> the society around you, though, is very much like sort of, you know, they could theocratic, and you know, they're very intent on like, no, we need to use our political power. We need to use force to enforce our beliefs. That, 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 if that's the culture that you're in. That might be. It was a different culture about this particular uh, doctrine, right? Okay, so I just want you to sit with it a little bit, saying, you know, would, you, would that be your hill? And then we're going to do triage on baptism in a second, so we're going to find out if it really is your hill. Okay, but what skills do we need to, to have these kinds of conversations that can get a little dicey? As I like to say, you can have your panties in a tight wad about something, and be very contentious with your whoever you're arguing with, right? So we need intellectual and moral virtues in our day, especially, to do triage. So we need humility. Why? So we don't kill people. <laughs> so, we don't, so we don't kill people. But we need humility um, to say something like, I might be wrong about this. If, especially if it's something debatable that has some weight on either side. If you can keep in your mind or say that phrase, even if you think you're right, I might could, I could be wrong about this, okay? That's what a debatable issue is. We're not talking about first, those, those short list of first rank issues, right? And then you want to be curious. So if you never heard there was a different kind of view about something, you want to say, well, I've never heard of that. Tell me what your reasons are for, you grew up that way, what are your reasons for holding that view like that? Why would you say it's first rank? I mean, do you think that the people in 1529 were, were <laughs> I don't think they were having, I don't think they had the intellectual virtues they were just at each other's throats. So we need to have this. Fair-mindedness and tenacity and courage are things you need to, if you haven't investigated for yourself um, on an issue, it might take you a little while. So it's not like something you're going to like study in an afternoon and then have all the answers. So this might take you a while. You've ha got to have tenacity. And you have to be careful in your study what you read. Read the opposite view. Uh, you know, represent the opposite view well. What, what's the strongest view they have? Um, and so that help, all these help us have wisdom in our conversations. OK? I'm really big on intellectual virtues. Can you all tell? I want us to have these virtues. And I'm going to watch y'all because we're fixing to do triage. I'm going to see if you're using your virtues. OK, <clears throat> so let's get to the criteria. The criteria, and, and this is what he uses in the book, but this is also some criteria that I saw as I read about this uh, the past month or so. First of all, how clear is the Bible on this doctrine? We talked about Revelation, how it's maybe not quite as clear. All the different views have, have biblical support. So uh, you have to figure out how clear is the Bible on this? And what is its importance to the gospel itself? And what is the testimony of the historical church, the church fathers, the creeds, right? you got to investigate that. What is its effect on the church today? Is it a divisive topic? Are, are, are people divided on it? And just 
just keep asking yourself, well, what if I'm wrong about this? What would happen to me? Would I have to stop? Would I think I'm not a Christian if I was wrong about it? Do you see what I mean? Sam, was that your hand? No. no, you're stretching. Okay. What other criteria would you put for first rank? Is this a good list? The, you know, how, mu how much support do you have for it? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, if something lines up with the early church and with, seems to have a good scriptural support, maybe isn't fully clear, and seems to have um, strong adherence to the gospel, you should probably be really... It's almost a kind of a cumulative effect, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. So here's a short list, and I'm going to say short list as... Hello, bro and Anna. Um, <laughs> Short list of first rank doctrines, okay? First, tri the God is triune, one God in three persons. The deity and humanity of Christ and salvation is only through Christ. The death, burial, and bodily resurrection of Jesus. Justification by faith or salvation by grace. And the authority of the scriptures. Okay. So, I say short list because maybe you would want to add some. And we're, we don't all agree on what's first rank, but I think that most people, most traditions would ag agree with the, the short list. Do you? What do you think, my people who are... Sam, would you? I mean, just if I were thinking about this from a, like a Catholic or an Orthodox perspective, yeah. something like authority of scriptures might be a little farther down because sola scriptura isn't as important as tradition. Right. Um, so then you would you would probably well you would still have authority of scriptures, but you would add authority of church fathers, tradition, tradition like yeah. right? So you might add that, Ben. Well, not just the Catholic tradition either, but also like. About authority of scripture, okay. You mean um, there there would be a range of views about that? Uh, mainline evangelical, different right? No, okay. Different. Meaning, you mean are you talking about like inerrancy or what? Uh, in general, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I think would anybody deny that the fact that scripture has authority is a core? What authority? What the authority means is a big question. Yeah. I would think that only a, a, there would be some Protestants that would deny the authority of Scripture outright. Ben, were you thinking like there's there's Unity. different views of uh, yeah. of inerrancy? I was of oh, of inerrancy, authority in general. Oh, authority in general. Okay, Jackson. Maybe like complete authority. I know I know it's some teachings authority. that will disregard passages. Okay, okay. Like, I heard one message from a pulpit that was like, John was written by, like, John, but he was under, like, Roman oppression, so he was, he's actually writing it through this lens, so there's this big power struggle that nobody else except me knows about, <laughs> so now I'm going to use that to relate it to something completely off topic. Mm -hmm. So, something to that. Hmm. Like, I know, um, Catholics may you know, hesitate, our Catholic friends, and if, if you're Catholic, you can back me up on this, but they may, like, hesitate to just parse out doctrines, but they would rather say it's just essential to be a member of the Catholic Church, right? That's a, just a broad statement. But I will say I did find, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be wrong, but Vatican II uh, says men and women who believe in Christ and have been truly baptized are in communion with the Catholic Church, even though this communion is imperfect. That's kind of a big statement. I, I, I take it as at face value. Um, so 
I'm encouraged by that, that there's unity in probably first rank doctrines across Christendom. Um, okay. So you could add to this, but all I'm saying is this is maybe a short list that we could say. And when I did some reading, most of the time these things came up. These were the things that, came, that were ranked first rank. So criteria for second rank is, the main one is that you would say, well, it's not essential to the gospel. So that would be the biggie, the big criteria to wrestle with. And, but it, it's very important to your, to the health of your church, to your tradition, to your church practices, okay? It would be important for that. In other words, and see, you're, you're Christians coming to school, trying to find a church. You're probably trying to find a church that you align with, even on second rank issues. You're not going to join a church that is completely foreign to you on how you, how you think of these, these um even second rank issues. So, and, and so we might, we might disagree on what second, second rank. And I'll tell you this, all, most of the heated, um, divisive um, arguments are about second, second rank um, issues. And they might even... You might even say, well, that's not second rank, that's first rank. So even some second rank issues are so important, they, get, they can be pushed up into first rank. But uh, sacraments in general, what they mean, which ones, what are they? Protestants would say baptism and the Lord's Supper are the ordinances or the, 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 what God has commanded. And um, uh, Orthodox and Catholics would have seven sac sacraments, I think, or more sacraments. Baptism, who gets, who gets baptized? The meaning of it, the mode of it, what does it mean? Communion, the Lord's Supper, the meaning of it, who gets it, who's, who's able to receive it, and who gives it? That, that, those are issues. Role of women in the church, oh my gosh, there's various range of, uh, range of, views on role of women in the church. Church governance, just the authority of, of your tradition, the authority in, in your church tradition, and even spiritual gifts, which would fall, I think, under second rank. I think that Zach puts, puts uh, spiritual gifts in third rank, but a lot of people rank it in second. Okay. Nobody has any comments on that? I thought y'all were going to buck me on that. Sam, you're going to just sit there? Is that okay? Yeah, that looked pretty good. Okay. I mean. <laughs> okay. So third rank is we should not divide over these issues, okay? Uh, we already said eschatology and anything about, like, interpretation of origins, creation days, age of the earth. Mind you, these are important issues that, we, that you would want to have convictions about, right? Trey's going, yes. Uh, and they, and they uh, weigh on other doctrines probably, but you would want to focus on like um, God is creator, there's a historical Adam and Eve, there was a historical fall. Those things might take precedent over some of the details of, of these, these issues. But I would say you might put this as second rank, but I don't know. Don't you probably have, is there, is there church traditions that divide over, like, these issues? I don't think so. Well, I think Calvary Chapel has, like, its specific Spec um, eschatology. Oh, like, uh, pre, pre-millennial? Yeah, I think that's right. Well, our church does, Fun, too. Fundamental, Fundamental, yeah. Fundamentalists definitely will divide over any of the issues that you could... Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. They like to divide. Okay. I think one of the issues with that is, uh, I heard someone else say, is that some of these issues are like downstream effects of other doctrines that are more important. Right. In particular end time stuff, it's not like, with, with origins, you can find basically any position in any denomination. But with like end times, that's usually an outworking of things like 
uh, how you interpret, like your general interpretive paradigm of the whole Bible. Right. And, you know, whether you read the Old Testament or not, or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so those are typically, so I think they can be used more as, like, lagging indicators of, of divisions rather than as things that actually divide. So, like, in my tradition, for example, we don't argue about end time stuff, <laughs> but, like, the disagreements that we have are probably not the same disagreements. Yeah. You're not you going to find a whole lot of dispensationalists in a yeah, well, yeah. So that's right. like a good example. Like there, there are no dispensationalists or, or yeah. like rapture type stuff in yeah. my tradition. But that's because we have higher order things, you know, about uh, things like covenant theology and things like that. That, and we read the Old Testament, and so the downstream effect of that. The downstream. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, hey! Um, my was the Old <laughs> but, but the downstream effect of that is that there are some debates that we don't have right. because of earlier stuff. In, in, in that case, so, so my, my point on that is that when you say do churches divide over this, they divide over other things. I think so. Yeah, that, that are, that are behind. And they're downstream. That's what I, I think. That's true. <laughs> I think that actually, like moral, like what you should do and what's moral or right, almost falls into a second rank issue as well. That falls down um, in many ways, like mm -hmm. abortion or free choice, like all of those, like what are moral actions Christians should or shouldn't do, that becomes a big deal. Mm -hmm. They can divide churches. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, fourth rank are things like music, alcohol use, beverage, dancing, food, hair length, hair covering, um, are y'all too young to know Footloose? Footloose. Footloose. No, this is the old one. This is the old one. I can't exactly see the picture, so. Oh, it's small. Footloose. Do y'all know that one? Okay, and you know the story, right? They're, they, like, couldn't dance, and they couldn't dance, bro Ashley, this is not important. It's fourth rank. But you don't want me to go through the whole thing. No, 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 no. Y'all know it, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Oh, that's so good. Y'all aren't as young as I thought. Okay. Uh, so Titus 3, 9 says, and also, if you, I grew up in a very fundamentalist, dogmatic environment. And so this is what's normally called, if, you're, if these are first rank at your church, if this is first rank, that's usually what's called legalism. Anybody grow up with in that environment? Nobody? Oh, yeah, I got some. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you. Okay. Interestingly enough, uh, the churches of Christ actually divided from the disciples of Christ denomination based on music choices. Music. Based on because the churches of Christ wanted to worship a cappella. I know. I thought about this when I, yeah. Whoa, I didn't only worship Yahweh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually, in that case, yeah. it, was, it was considered a higher rank doctrine. I was music choices. I, I meant you know whether you sing hymns or sing you know, sure. yeah. Ben. Another true Christ movement in the 1960s. Uh, they split. They split over uh, orphans' homes. Whether the church should support orphans' homes. That was the responsibility of the uh, church or the individual members of the church. Like parish church organization. Wow, y'all are a y'all are a spicy group there. There's also church splits over whether or not there should be kitchens and the church or outside of the church. Oh, yeah. Kitchens? Kitchens. What's wrong with the kitchen? Because, like, working on the Sabbath. Oh. Oh. I think it was also the thing about, I think it partially comes from, like, that 1 Corinthians 11, where they go, like, uh, well, people are, you know, you're eating when you're supposed to be taking the Lord's Supper, and it's bad for you to do that, so, like, no kitchens. Okay. Okay. So, see? Triage is very relevant. Sam? So it seems that second rank issues are where people start getting killed. Fourth rank issues are the ones that are really well, fun to start getting killed. Well, that, no, there's... Fourth rank is how you get 30,000 yeah. Protestant denominations. Yeah. So, <laughs> Titus 3.9 says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. So we need to keep... Yeah, we... I don't think we're not going to speak of fourth rank issues again. Okay. So let's very quickly, I, I, I hate it that maybe it's, maybe it's providential that we don't have that much time. What I wanted to, so 
baptism, you have to understand, uh, baptism is very divisive, right? It's um, something we can talk about and do triage on, and we're not all going to come to the same conclusion, okay? Um, There's all these different views, the landscape of views to study. The one I'm going to sort of just hone in on for us to practice our intellectual virtues is baptismal regeneration and versus baptism is uh, uh, symbolic, okay? So first of all, we have to decide what? Is baptism, the doctrine of baptism, first rank or second rank? It's close, right? It's kind of close. First rank is how clear is it in the Bible and is it essential to the gospel? And, and uh, what's the testimony of the historical church? I'm just reminding you of the criteria, right? Second rank, basically, I have these that bold. It's, it's not essential to the gospel itself. So, uh, did Jackson, did you have something to say? No, I was just saying Okay, you already decided? No, we can't decide now. We have to, we have to work through it. Okay. So, on these two, so I boiled it down to these two questions so that we could figure out the rank. How clear is it in the Bible, and is it essential to the gospel? And guess what? There's lots of verses on both sides. So Mark 16, 6, 16 says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, in most of the, most of the verses where baptism is mentioned, it is, li- it is closely linked to uh, the gospel or believing. Um, In John 3, 5, this is Nicodemus. Jesus says, unless you're born of water and the spirit, you will not um, see the kingdom of heaven. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized for for the forgiveness of your sins. I think that's Peter in his sermon, um, his first sermon. Acts 22, 16, rise. And this is what Ananias told Paul when he was saved on the road to Damascus. Ananias said, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So what I meant by baptismal regeneration is what? On this side, on this, what do I mean? What, is it, what are we trying to make a case for here? That the actual baptism washes away your sin and is salvific, right? It's efficacious. God uses the baptism as a means to wash away your sins. Can anybody say it better? Sam, can you say it better than that? Uh, which one? The baptismal regeneration. That it's required for salvation and it washes it, it. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of different concepts of it. Like, you know, baptismal regeneration can kind of refer to a couple of different things. For one thing, it just refers to, like, sort of baptism is necessary for salvation. Right. Baptism is the normative means by which salvation is attained. Okay. It can also refer to, like, a very specific theological view of, like, it is at the moment of baptism that an individual is regenerated, regardless of whether or not they're elect. Like that's how some Protestants like when you get into really yeah. theological stuff. Yeah. But in general, it just means. I think for us, we would just say that for this view, it is ne- it's necessary to the gospel. It's necessary for salvation. So it's essential to the gospel, and it's it you're not saved unless you're baptized. Trey. Um, all I was really going to say is that um, like it, it, it's making the case for the argument that. Um, even if you have like, verbally accepted the Lord, uh, your sins are not washed away until you are physically in the water. Right. So well, God uses that as sure the means. Yourself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so and uh, let's see. Did I do? Um, in Matthew 28, it's a great commission, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. So, there is, so lots of verses connect belief with baptism. I'm not, and, and you can't get away from that, right? Um, and some even say uh, the washing away of sins. It's the baptism washes away sins. So the second, but, but you can't leave it there. We have to look at the other verses because there are other verses that um, seem to definitely imply that only faith is required for salvation, only faith. And so that would be John 3, 16, that we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
John 5, 24 is truly, truly, I say to you, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 20, 31 is, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Um, 1 John 5, 13 is very similar. I write these things so you may believe that the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Um, in Acts 16, this is when the jailer point blank asks Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? You remember that story? Great time to make this clear. <laughs> they, did right after they did. They did right after. But what did Paul say? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then afterwards, they were baptized. I, and so we're not negating baptism, right? That's not the point. Um, so Acts 10, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness. Oh, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name, talking about Christ, that we're actually, our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, right? That, that would be the picture of... Baptism is n not essential to the gospel. Um, John 3, let's see. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which we said earlier, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Um, let's see. Which one is most important? Well, the interesting one, I think, is 1 Corinthians 1.17, since we're doing triage. Paul, in, to the Corinthians, um, separates his preaching of the gospel with baptism. And he sort of subordinates the, his baptizing part and his preaching the gospel part. He says, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So he, he would, it, you can look, you can read it for yourself, that little passage in first Corinthians. Um, Paul uh, didn't baptize everyone that he preached to preach the gospel to. So, um, that's just a point of, of, of um, evidence for that. So what do you think? So what I want you to know is that it's debatable. <laughs> if you're looking at, and I, I'm not a theologian, but I mean, I'm just gathering both, si both, both sides. There's support for baptismal regeneration, and there's also support for baptism not being essential to the gospel. However, on the, on the next criteria, which would be church fathers and creeds, it seems that they're in agreement. This would be Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and St. Augustine all believe that baptism was regenerative, re baptismal regeneration, okay? So uh, it's pretty across the board. If you, if you read the church fathers. And we will also say as far as the, the criteria about uh, how, it, how is it in church history, it is one of the most divisive areas of theology in church history. Uh, the, uh, Gavin Orland says more Christians were killed by each other over baptism during the Reformation than by the Roman Empire over faith in Christ. That's kind of hard to believe, right? So, what say you? Well, here, let's not go to this yet. How do I go, how do I go back? Okay. Okay, let's not go. How, so, tell me what you think. First of all, you have to decide if it's first or second rank. Re remember? So, you have to decide if it's first, it's essential. Who thinks it's first rank? First rank. Sam, you don't think it's first rank? It's pretty close. It's close. Okay, so it's... It's not, but I mean, there's also a difference between, like, the belief and the practice, right? I'm not sure, I mean, is believing that baptism is regenerative necessary for the gospel? Like, right. is that actually essential, or is it just that we believe that right. you need to baptize people? Right. 
know, there's a little bit of a... It's kind That's of a nuance. There that that would be nuanced. Thing. That would be a nuanced view. So but you could still... Is, is this Christians killing Christians, or is this Christians killing filthy pagans? <laughs> <laughs> because if it's, the, if it's the first one, then it's probably a second rank issue. Well, <clears throat> what, I, what I would say, if you, haven't, if you can kind of think about it this way, first rank doctrines divide us from non-believers. Second rank doctrines, you know, divide us within the church, right? And, and so I, I think you would not, you wouldn't want... And the reason why I say that, so like what what Sam just nuanced um, said was good. So then if you take it as a first rank issue, your brother or sister who doesn't, then you are saying basically what? They are not Christians. That they're not Christians. Okay. Which puts you in a, so not that, not if that's, your, if that's what you think, that's what, that's what your conclusion is, right? Um, that, would, that would mean you, it would, it would um, limit your ministry with other people because you wouldn't, you wouldn't view um, someone who believed that it was second rank, you wouldn't believe they were, they were Christians. Katie? Once they've read through the scripture and they've learned it and they've learned things about the church history, if they're not wanting to be baptized as a Christian, then they would say, well, maybe there is something to worry about with their faith or their belief. The same way if I saw a Christian who's yeah. always walking around, getting righteously drunk and working with prostitutes, I would have to seriously wonder, is that guy really well, the, Because there's a point at which that's right. moral actions are important. But even if you're in this camp, you believe you need to obey and be baptized. You just don't believe it's regenerative. So that, that's not these people. Yeah, like it's important to note that pretty much all the Christian denominations still, like apart from yeah. like the Salvation Army, pretty much every Christian denomination or even non-denomination still baptizes people. Right. And it's still considered important. Well, I mean, there are like Christian groups that don't think baptism is important anymore and they don't really do it. There are churches that don't. Um... And I guess to say that, like, when we say essential to the gospel, is the gospel just our salvation in the sense of somehow, well, Christ died and our sins are wiped away, or is it also our regeneration? Well, you notice, that I, you notice that all through this I haven't been saying we're judging people's salvation very much, except for we just kind of talked about that. So if we're talking about doctrines, we're talking about propos- the propositions of the gospel, right? So it's different from saying... Zach, help me out. It's different from saying um, it's necessary for salvation or it's essential for the gospel. They're, those are two. Those are two different things, it right? It seems like we're asking more about what is baptism doing rather than is baptism important. Right? Well, yeah, it's the meaning of it, right? Yeah. I guess I'm just saying, like, is the gospel just Christ and Christ is done, or is the gospel also? the Spirit's work in your life, building you up and making you into a Christian. Because if the gospel also has that part of it, then baptism might actually be a first-rank doctrine. Indeed, to me. At least. Because that's part of your spiritual growth and formation. And so if you're denying, those things aren't important. So you, you, could, add, you could add it to the first-rank list. You definitely could. That's a criteria. Yeah. Essentially, so I'm right now. Yeah. Um, so do you see how it works? We're not going to, you know, we're, our goal tonight, remember, isn't to, isn't to nail down everything, but we want to learn how to think through it so that we are better, better able to have these conversations. So let's talk about, this is how I thought we could conclude. So if you determine it's second rank, then you agree that Christians can, and, I'm, and for, this, for this I was talking about the, the uh Regenerative, the meaning of baptism, whether it's regenerative or it's symbolic, of what it's the outward expression of your inner salvation, right? So you believe that Christians can disagree and still have unity, 
and it's not a hill to die on. You're not going to get drowned for, oh, you weren't here for the drowning. I'm sorry. You won't get drowned for, um, or you wouldn't want to be on that hill. You're not going to be on that hill, right? And most of all, uh, you do see that baptism is important. It bears on our, our obedience to Christ, and it's a proclamation of the gospel within the church, and it's probably for church membership. And it probably determines which tradition you are in. But if you determine its first rank, then it's li it likely separates you from other professing Christians, perhaps. And it, you could see it as a hill to die on. For example, the Catholic Church affirms that for believers, all sacraments like baptism of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. Okay? So those, those are how you would, that's how you would come to conclusions after you've done triage. Okay? So our takeaways are this, and then Sam's going to um, dismiss us. Study well. So we just touched the surf. We just kind of scratched the surface of baptism. We could do, we could do more. So study well, form convictions. And be able to make a case for triage when divisive issues arise. You can share this with other people and say, look, there's, you know, is this really a first rank issue that we're arguing about? Or is it a third rank or a fourth rank issue that we're arguing about? And then develop intellectual virtues for doing triage. That's it. <laughs>